This morning, if you would, you can open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 4. We have been going through the book of 1 Samuel, and this morning we have reached chapter 4, which is a relatively brief chapter. Let me read this chapter, and then we will pray and begin to dig in. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Listen as I read God's word. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines, and they encamped at Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in lines against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Thus, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of the enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 5. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines lest you become slaves of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. Verse 10. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And they fled every man to his home, and there was a very great slaughter. For 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the Ark of the Covenant was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas died. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. And when he arrived, Eli sitting on his bed by the road was sitting on his bed by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of the covenant of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, "What is this uproar?" And the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? And he brought the news, he who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the Ark of the Covenant, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the Ark of, the Coven the Ark of God was captured, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman attending to her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. And the Ark of the Covenant, because the Ark of the Covenant of God had been captured and because the her father-in-law and her husband verse 22 and she said the glory has departed from Israel for the ark has been captured let's pray and then we'll continue this uh, consider this passage God as we um, look to you right now 
Again, we take note that this is your word, that it's not idle, idle stories and accounts, but it is communicated so that we would learn something concerning it. Lord, we thank you for the richness of your word. We thank you for its constant vitality and sure relevance in every stage of our life. When we consider it aright and understand it clearly, it has such wonderful and useful correction, instruction, and impact upon our lives. God, my hope and prayer this morning is that you would grant that I would speak your word faithfully and clearly, and that your people who you've gathered here this morning, that you would give them open and eager hearts to hear and receive and know. And God, that as we consider this passage, our sense of your greatness and your glory would be enlarged. Uh, our recognition of the unique and remarkable way that you unfold your purposes in this world. Lord, that we would further gain clarity and that you would be glorified and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So coming out of the beginning of this, we know that Samuel was, was born of that miraculous gift to Hannah. Then he was given to grow up and live with Eli the priest at Shiloh, away from his family as Hannah had promised. So he was raised by the priest in the environment of the priest's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. We've seen before reaching this chapter that those two men were vile and wicked. Not just in terms of saying that generally speaking, they were, the scriptures tell us, directly disobeying the instruction of how the sacrifices were to be given. And so they were taking those things that God had ordered and God had designed that were for him. And they were using it and abusing it for themselves. They were coming in and they were selecting and taking the meat before it had gone through the proper processes, taking the choice pieces, even among those things that were specifically dedicated exclusively to be burned to God, they were taking from people beforehand. And these two men and their father on the side were fattening themselves, indeed feasting on what was to be a sacrifice to the Lord. God had provided that through that sacrifice, the Levites and the priests would receive more than sufficient sustenance. But this was not enough for these men. They did not simply want sustenance and survival. They wanted to satisfy their pleasures and their desires to live by their wants and their wantonness. And that often goes beyond the pleasures of filling the belly, the belly to even the indulgences of the body. And they began to engage themselves in immoral relations with women who were serving at the entranceway of the tent. The, the deviation... The sinfulness, the perversity of these two young priests is inexcusable. The scriptures have gone on to tell us in the previous chapter, Eli had known about these things and he did not address it. He did not restrain them. We did see in chapter 3 that after he had become old, and now the reputation was spreading and getting too bad, he then addressed his sons. But having already let them go so far and not restrained them, they did not come back, they did not respond. God had indicated to Eli, as a result of this, your two sons will be taken away from you. And just so you know that this is not coincidence or accident, as nothing actually is, because God is sovereign. These two boys are going to die on the same day. And further than that, we had also seen Eli himself and all of his descendants would never, never one man will ever live to old age, and they lose their privileged position as high priests. That will be given to another. 
That's the situation. God had communicated this even to young Samuel. And emboldened, Samuel told these things to Eli. The word of the Lord that God had given through Samuel to Eli, even in his childhood, that word began to spread and people began to be aware of the condemnation that God had pronounced against the house of Eli because of their sin. But beyond that, we also know if we look at at the nature and the history of the kingdom of Israel, you could often see this. As go the priests, so go the people. When those who are responsible to teach instruct and exemplify God's word and God's standards are doing the opposite. They're ignoring God's word, they're defying God's standard and living for themselves, then what's going to be the state of society? What's going to be the condition of the people? They don't have the law. Even the scripture says these men, they did not know God. And so into this uh, circumstance, we now come to chapter 4 where God is going to fulfill the word that he spoke through Samuel to the children of Israel and I want to begin by seeing this they come out to battle so it's it's always interesting to see this because because we have such uh, limited influence in our lives The the people we can influence, the events that we can influence are, are very, very limited. But God, not at all. God can employ any means, any individual, any nation, even indeed the enemy, should he desire to fulfill his purposes. And what he does here in in bringing his judgment, he stirs up this animosity that already exists between Israel and the Philistines. He stirs up this bold, inappropriate confidence in the children of Israel that they can come out and they can battle against these Philistine oppressors and somehow overcome them. And the scripture tells us concerning that, as, as this passage opens up, it says, now... Israel went to battle against the Philistines. Now it says they went out and encamped at Ebenezer. Now Ebenezer is an interesting word and a meaningful word, but it's told to us in chapter 7. In chapter 7 is actually when that place becomes Ebenezer. Here it's, it's kind of beforehand saying it because when this is written it's already known. So we'll look more deeply at Ebenezer, the idea of a stone of help when we get to chapter 7. But this is simply to say the general vicinity north of Jerusalem where they went out to face this battle. They encamped against the, uh, the, Phil- the Philistines And it says in verse 2, the Philistines drew up in lines against Israel. The battle spread and Israel was defeated before the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us before the Philistines? Here's the first thing thought I want to share with us today of seven simple thoughts that we'll consider. The first one is this. Here we find a reasonable question. A very reasonable question. What is the question they ask? Why has the Lord defeated us this day before the Philistines? Oh, how wonderfully correct that question is. They're not asking, why did the Philistines defeat us? Or why did we lose? There at least is some semblance of what is too oft forgotten that the outcome of every battle is in whose hands? The battle belongs to the Lord. It tells us, and that we love this passage, we quote it and know it in Proverbs chapter 21. Verse 30 and 31, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. The horse is made ready for the battle, 
but the victory belongs to the Lord. So the outcome doesn't depend on the warriors, it doesn't depend on the weapons. What actually is going to unfold, win or lose, victory or defeat, is in whose hands? God's alone. And so these elders ask the right question. Why has the Lord done this to us? Now, particularly in their covenant context, it makes sense. Because remember, if you read in Deuteronomy chapter, say, 28 and following, you begin to have that reiteration of the old covenant, that nationalistic covenant that God made with the nation and people of Israel. That if they walk in His ways and obey His commandments and statutes with their whole heart, what would they experience? Much blessing and protection. Their crops would be abundant. Their enemies would be defeated. God would protect them on all sides. So they would have some expectation that God is able to give us victory. And if we win, it's because God is with us. And if we lose, it's because God is against us. Because that was the covenant relationship that they had with God. Now please be careful. We can have the same tendency. Something goes wrong in our life. Why has the Lord done this to me? Or maybe something goes wrong in his life. He's out of fellowship with God. That's why it happened to him. He, he's facing all these problems and all these losses because there's some wickedness, some impurity, some wrong idea in his life. No! He's not in that old covenant that Israel was in. Now, there's no problem in asking ourselves what indeed may be God's purpose in this. What indeed may God desire to teach me through this? But we remember, when Paul faced a thorn in the flesh, what was the reason why? What sin was he guilty of? Well, not quite yet. The pride was coming in order to keep him from becoming elated in the flesh. So wait, because he would have? gotten prideful he was going to become that way God preempted it with problems yes does God have a right to do that well God has a right to do anything and everything he should ever design or desire do you know why he's God yeah it's pretty simple and, and so, these the, the same kind of things, remember, even we saw before, uh, in a few previous weeks, the, the question even came one time from the disciples to Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it his parents' sin, or did he sin? And what was Jesus' answer? That God may be glorified in this. It, it is not because he did anything wrong. It's too easy for us to take this and forget its old covenant context. Pop it out and put it on people today and say, whatever's wrong, something wrong in your life, you're not having enough faith. You're not walking with the Lord. You're doing something wrong. Whereas we see Paul who had given his life to serve God say at times, to the present hour I'm hungry and thirsty sleepless poorly clothed we see Paul facing circumstances where everyone in Asia has turned away from him what happened maybe I might even say this here was at one point the son of God come in the flesh and there was a season in which large crowds were following him but as he came down towards the end of his ministry what began to happen People began to turn away. People began to reject him and repudiate him. Many turned away in John chapter 6 because of the hardness of his teaching. Further, when it came down towards the end, and they had the opportunity to either release Barabbas or to release Jesus, what was the cry of the people gathered there? Crucify him! Crucify him! Well, Everybody's turned against Jesus. What, 
what must he have done wrong? And we know that question doesn't work, does it? Because the answer is, he did nothing wrong ever. He was completely without sin, and yet he was rejected by men. He was arrested. People maligned him, lied against him, abused him, crucified, and killed him painfully. We might, some people might consider him forsaken by God and afflicted. But ask yourself, was there any mistake there? Was there any faithlessness there? Was there any failure there? No. And so we want to be a little bit careful before we run forward. In their context, that is the right question. And in everything that we may face, it is a reasonable question to ask. Is it that this is the loving discipline of the Lord's hand? Let me examine myself. Let me examine my life. Let me examine my walk. And if I find that there are things that are out of sync, out of accord with God's word, let me make it right. Okay? So uh, the, the danger is, can be two different ways. One can, can be every problem is your mistake and your sin. That's not a guarantee. The other danger is from the other side. It's never to correct me of anything because I don't ever do anything wrong. Both of those notions are mistaken. Whatever comes, it is a reasonable question to ask, why, for what, is the Lord allowing this? And to assess whether it might be for discipline, whether it might be for correction, whether it might be for humility. Paul says there was an occasion where he was, by force of circumstances, almost despairing of life itself. And he said, this happened so that we would depend not on ourselves, but on God who saves us. So if the, if the purpose is in it is to deepen my dependence upon God and my confidence in His grace, then you know what I say? Let it be. Because He is God. And so it is a reasonable question that, they, that they've asked themselves here. But what's remarkable is in this, here their priests were evil. As a result of that, we know the general conduct of the people had fallen out of step with the word of God. And so here, instead of feeling remorse, instead of feeling repentance, instead of seeking the Lord, they knew that the Lord was in control of things, but they did not look to any correction within themselves or any fault within themselves. Rather, they got their own solution. They didn't go. See, already they had come to recognize the word of the Lord had been rare, but it had now, from verse 1, become known that God was communicating to them through Samuel. They could have sent a little fella, run to Samuel, have Samuel inquire of the Lord for us, as was the pattern of the Old Covenant before they had the totality of the scriptures that we have today. Ask him, what should we do? What would the Lord have us do? Should we go to battle or should we not go to battle? What should we do? Because sometimes God's instruction would be what would seemingly be unreasonable things. The way you're going to get through that impenetrable wall is to walk around it. What? Yeah, just walk around it. Once, then the next day do it twice. On the seventh day, do it seven times. When you've walked around it, then just shout and blow the trumpets. And this impenetrable wall that's held up against a multitude of battles, it's going to fall down so that no stone will be on top of another. Who's buying that? How will that happen? But I'll tell you who's buying that. Those who have sensed and seen the power of God. These men had, many of them had seen and sensed it. God had done those great uh, and mighty deliverance out of Egypt. He had provided miraculously for them. Actually, the children of Israel, even as they go to Jericho, they've passed through the Jordan on dry ground while it was overflowing. So they understand that God can do whatever it is that he is pleased to do. 
but they did not inquire of the Lord. They did not investigate themselves. They had their own solution. So from a reasonable question, it's followed with a wrong course. What's the course of correction? What's the course of action that they took? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemy. Now note this. Who's saying this? The bad guys. The ba- well, these are the... It's uh, like the got closer to, to Sure. The, these are the elders of Israel, which means they should be more, the more mature, the more experienced. They, they're indeed the, the leaders and decision makers in the community. It, the elders were actually established as a group even back in the days of Jethro and Moses to be leaders among the people that, that would help Moses in sort of coordinating. So these are the guys that generally you would look to. And, and these fellows, uh, their idea was not what is not right between us and God. What would God have us do? But their thought was this. What would we have God do? Ah, I know. It's, it, it's not what, what God's design is, but we, we will want. And they go and send it. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, remember, it's not an idol. There, there is no image of God on it. We have the cherubim on top of it with their wings outstretched touching one another which above that represents the mercy seat and in that area above it there would be a manifestation of a cloud or a presence of God from which Moses would speak to God and God would speak to him and then he would speak to the people. So it represented his presence. It was not his presence. It was an ark. It was made by men. What was in the ark was Ten Commandments, a copy of that covenant that had been given to those people. The rod of Aaron that had budded was in there. You know what was not in the ark of the covenant? God, exactly. And so, uh, but the the notion began to, to stir in their minds somehow that, If we want God to win this battle for us, we need to bring God here. Will it work like that? Can can they just bring God there while not walking in his his ways, while not submitting their heart to him in true worship? Can they just bend God to do their will while all the while they are not bending to do God's will. Will that really work? And so here's the idea that is in their mind. We've got the fix. Bring it in and bring it here and we'll get this done. They employ their own wisdom. They employ their own instruction. Now they could have almost seemingly some biblical precedent. Here's where the danger lies. There were battles that we faced before that the Ark of the Covenant went out before the people and we were victorious. Whenever we were supposed to move in in the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant would set out first and we would follow it. So, many victories in the past were preceded by the presence of the Ark. So, here we go. Biblical pattern, biblical precedent. We're just going to follow the boom. Uh, two and then we're going to get it but is that the way of real faith is that the way of a real life and walk with God it's not that is thinking that that by steps or processes or procedures and not by heart and truth and faithfulness so they build out their idea and maybe they could even speak of the ways it was done. Maybe they could pull out and read and remember snippets from the book of the law and say we remember in numbers this is what happened and we remember this is what happened. And so thinking what happened then must happen now. 
Is that a guarantee? No. They've got to seek the will of the Lord, ask him what ought to be done. Now, what's interesting is, so they go and get it. They bring it. Who brings the Ark of the Covenant? Hophni and Phinehas, these wicked priests, which is unique. God is using, actually, the the selfish attempt of, of Israel here to compel God to do their will to actually fulfill God's will to bring judgment on Hophni and Phinehas. So here they think they're, they're going to control the outcome of the battle by doing this, not realizing all of their, the things that they're doing, even God permitting their selfish decisions, is moving towards the fulfillment of His judgment against Hophni and Phinehas. But what's interesting is this, when it, as soon as it comes into the camp, verse 5, as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave out a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. More literally there, the earth shook. The earth was agitated. I mean, it's graphically giving us a sense that it was, in, it was incredibly loud. So loud that it was even heard by the Philistines. Now I want you to note this. The elders were placing their total confidence in what? For victory. The Ark of the Covenant. The people, as it came to them, what did they, what did they, how was their response? Excitement, joy, confidence. Do you think they were faithless? They believed the Ark of the Covenant had everything necessary to grant them that victory. They were wrong. Because the ark doesn't have the power. The faith in what you want doesn't have the power. God has the power. Don't believe what you believe. Believe what he says. But they wanted to disregard the word of God, disregard the instruction of God, and just, we just believe in him. We're just believing him for this victory. Well, has he said he's giving you a victory here? Where, when did he promise you a victory in this particular battle, in this particular historic situation in Israel? Well, he didn't, but we're just believing him for it. It doesn't work. They try it and it doesn't work. There's a tragic influence of the same way of thinking to an extent that presses itself into the modern world if we just believe what we believe no believe God take him at his word trust in his will but so here the wisdom of the elders we've got the fix this is the right way bring the ark the agreement of the priests the spiritual leaders they bring the ark the total cooperation and agreement of the people listen the priests the elders, all of the people, wrong. What? How could everybody be wrong? I mean, the word they're using there for the Lord is the real word for the Lord. It's based off precedent of God's own work in history. Well, this is the kind of thing that happens. Using precedent, using right words, but in the end, it's not God, His word, His will, but God for us, instead of us for Him. It's no longer the, no longer the life that I now live in the flesh. I live for Him who saved me, as Paul says. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, as Paul says. It's rather this. Now... He's for me. And so whatever I want, whatever I need, I can compel him to do that. Some have even tried to take the same kind of notion and, think, and, and, and manipulate that to uh, other means. Rather than the ark, let's fast. Let's fast for this. And there's nothing wrong with fasting per se, but if, if someone thinks by fasting, I'm going to force God to give me this. No. We can't force 
God to do anything. And, and, and the rich reality is, hopefully, in a real fasting, a real humbling communion with God, God might bring our heart and mind into alignment with his word and his will, such that that demand, remove this thorn in the flesh from me, would, would end by saying, that's fine, don't remove it. Your grace is sufficient for me. That's fine. Don't, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so, well, here's just the danger that I want us to remember as we move forward. Groups, numbers, that doesn't mean anything. Well, this, these, these people must have it right because, I mean, look how big that church is. Well, this was the whole nation. And they were all wrong. Listen, it could be that every man is wrong. That every man is proven a liar. But God always proves true. We don't necessarily look to and listen to men. And so, uh, but what I want you to note is this. What they felt seems like real joy. What they felt was a real experience the Lord is with us. We feel it. We're so excited. Let's go fight. Do not follow your feelings. Follow the Lord. You mean I can't trust my feelings? No. Can't trust my elders and leaders? Not always. Then what do I trust? God. And trust God's word. Because men can and have erred. Don't ever, and I, I, unashamedly, don't ever take something as true because I said it. Be Berean. Search the scriptures to see whether these things are so because the scriptures are true. I am just a man. Now my, my wholehearted endeavor and desire is to be faithful to the word of the Lord. But you don't follow it because I said it. Follow it because the word of God says it and because you hopefully rightly understand and are convinced by it. This whole notion that they would somehow use God. In Psalm 81 it says this, in Psalm 81 verse 11. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. That's what I did. They, they wouldn't listen to me, so I give them over to follow what? Their own counsels. The things that they think are good. The things that they think are best. And the leaders say, we think we ought to do this. And the people say, amen and amen, let's do it. And the whole time, they're wrong. That's a scary thought, isn't it? And it goes on to say, Oh, that my people, verse 13, would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Then I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. They were defeated. They shouldn't have thought the problem is the ark wasn't here. The problem is our hearts are far from God. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, thirdly, there's an unfolding, really a remarkable complexity. The way that God works out things. So they call for the Ark of the Covenant to come. And in this remarkable complexity, we see this. The, the Ark comes with evil companions. The ones who bring the Ark by no means truly represent God. They represent everything that's reprehensible to God. But God is bringing them out purposefully. And so these men come out. We see these evil companions. We see this excessive confidence of the people. We see even initially what happens when this, in verse 7, when they hear the sound in the camp, the Philistines were afraid. The first thing that happens when they hear that sound and they hear the ark has come is we see an expressed cowardice. Oh no! Woe is us. And that's what it says in that passage. And now we, we don't quite get that because we only use the woe is me in, in moments of deep discouragement. 
they're using it in a moment of what they feel is certain destruction. Whoa, condemned, cursed, we're undone here. And, and then they, they recount some of the things that they're aware of concerning this God. Listen to what it says. I mean, clearly their theology is well off. Verse 7, it says they were afraid. They said a God has come into the camp. Had a God come into the camp? No. Now I ask you this question. If the ark remained in the tabernacle, was God not going to be able to give victory to Israel? Should he want to? Did God need the ark? No, no he didn't. Because it is the, the, there was a manifest presence of God for communicating to the children of Israel, but is God limited to one specific locale? Or is our God omnipresent? He's everywhere at all times. So they, they did not, God was, in a sense, is here with us now. He was already there in the camp. He was already reigning over all of the details of those battles. But they had begun, much like pagans, to compress and compartmentalize God into a box. Literally. I mean, we've heard that figure of speech. You put God into a box. But that's, in a sense, the way that they were thinking. And as that box comes out, he, he, they're saying, a God has come into them. And then they go on and say to this, Woe to us, nothing like this has happened. Uh, woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of... It says, these mighty gods. Were there, were there many gods? Uh, I'm going to proffer this notion as well. The Israelites were not sufficiently clear in their own described and declared distinctions the Philistines should have always thought of Israel as a people who had a God that the Philistines would think of the children of Israel at this point as a people who has gods shows the condition and state of Israel, as they were constantly, we see, going after idols and other things here. And so, uh, but look at verse 10, or verse 9. Take courage and be men. So uh, as, as they're frightened and as they're fearful and thinking, oh no, what will we do? Then they suddenly remember. But listen, if we do nothing... We lose, and we're their slaves. So we may as well stand up and fight. So take courage, and let's stand up and fight. So we see what I would call an enabled courage of the Philistines. When they were absolutely crushed, somehow they found the strength and I would proffer this. The reason why in that, in, that, in that desperate sense of we're undone, we can't do this, that they found strength, I would proffer this. Because God had purposed the destruction of, Eli, uh, of Eli's sons. Because God had purposed the defeat of Israel by the hand of the Philistines and the death of Hophni and Phinehas. And so it, sometimes we would look at this and say, somehow, somewhere in the state of this hopeless situation, an absolute abject terror, somehow they found the strength and boldness to fight. And I would proffer to you this. Many times when we say the word somehow, it's not somehow. There is a specific hand at work. The unseen hand, the invisible hand, indeed, the hand of God unfolding his purposes. Wait, so God would embolden the Philistines, the wicked nation, to fight against his people, to put them to condemnation? Would God do that? Yes, he does. He brings the Assyrians against them in their sin. He brings the Babylonians. The whole book of Judges was cycles of sin and subjugation. And then again, repentance and restoration. And these things go in a horrible cycle as the children of Israel don't listen. And so he, this, this all comes down and the battle begins in verse 10. So the Philistines fought. And what happened? Israel was defeated, and they fled, every man to his home. That's what happened. 
the ark didn't work. And here's a fact. The ark doesn't work. It's a piece of furniture made for the temple, made for the service of worship that God would make distinct and above which God would make himself and his will known to the people. But the ark remained a piece of furniture that did nonetheless significantly represent the presence of God. But I want you to understand this. The presence of God does not always mean for victory or for joy or for peace. I mean, sometimes it, the notions get, get caught up. I mean, we live in a day and age where we, we love the notion of to be, to be filled with the Spirit. And then men define that in different ways. So that, that's, this is what it's going to look like. Joy, bubbling up, excitement, effervescent emotion, overpouring, effusing, Allah. Well, it could and it can, but that is a limited definition. If you keep reading through the book of Acts, on one occasion where the proconsul was opposing him as he was preaching, the, the proconsul's assistant was opposing Paul as he was preaching the gospel. It says, Paul, filled with the Spirit, spoke to that man and said, You crooked man, that you would try to make the straight way crooked, you will now be blind for three days. Wait. Filled with the, where was the joy there? Where was the peace there? Where was the, where was the song and the dance? Uh, we are uniquely and separately defining these things in ways that don't necessarily take into account the totality of Scripture. Be careful with these things. The presence of God was indeed among them. The ark was brought among them. It was God's intention that Eli and Eli's sons, as well as the ark, would be captured. And that's what happened. The ark was captured. And even that the ark would be captured, we'll see next week God's wonderful display and intentional purposes in permitting the capture of that ark. So the result was that the ark was captured. In verse 10 and 11, they, every man fled to his home. I want to also note this, uh, at the end of 10, 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. Now you remember in the beginning of this chapter, uh, they were defeated and 4,000 men fell. When 4,000 fell, they thought, okay, we better fix this. Their fix resulted in what? 30,000 people now being killed. Because they were trying to fix their circumstances. When they ought to be fixing their hearts and fixing their eyes upon God, they're fixing it in other places. And we see the righteous condemnation come against them. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, it had said, God had said to uh, Eli in chapter 2 verse 34, This shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be a sign to you, both of them shall die on the same day. And in verse 11, it says, The Ark of the Covenant was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. And so when we see that, we see the prophecy in chapter 2, and then we see how it all unfolded in chapter 4, and we realize, wow, none of that was a mistake. God, God used the, the misplaced confidence of the children of Israel, the, the misplaced counsel of the elders of Israel. God used all of their misplacements, all of their mistakes, all of their vain attempts to manipulate God. God was working out his purposes perfectly to fulfill exactly what he had already designed. Wow. Those things are mind-blowing, aren't they? The, the, the width and detail in which God is intimately involved. And so then, note this also. We see it's followed by a ruinous collapse. In verse 12, this man of Benjamin now runs back from the battle. He comes to Shiloh and he announces to the people what happened. As he announces to the people what happened, they, they all hear what's going on. And what is their response? Oh no, this is terrible. 
the sound of their outcry is loud. And so this man, uh, Eli, then says, what's going on? He wants a report. This man of Benjamin now comes to Eli and gives the report. And what does, he, what does this man say to him? Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God has been captured. Now I want you to notice what it says in verse 18. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died for he was a man who was old and heavy. I mean, it's, it, it's an it's a unpleasant and, and somewhat graphic picture of him dying, but I wanted you to note this. It was when he heard the ark of the covenant had been taken. It, it, it wasn't when he heard that his sons were dead. He knew that was going to happen. <laughs> What hadn't actually been told to anybody was that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken. What's quite remarkable, even if you you begin to look down uh, uh, verse 19 and following, we now come to the daughter-in-law, and three times in the section about the daughter-in-law, she's lost her father-in-law, she's lost her husband, but the thing that is mentioned three times in verse 19 to the end of the chapter, it says uh, halfway through verse 19, she heard the news that the ark was captured and that her father and husband had died. At the end of uh, verse 21, it, she said the glory has departed because the ark of God has been captured. And the end of verse 22, the glory has departed from Israel, she said, for the ark of God has been captured. So somehow their focus is not so much on the death of loved ones here, but on the, the taking of this ark. What it, what it really represented, as it represented the presence of God to the people of Israel. Now that that ark is taken, it to them spoke with powerful symbolism, God is not with us. Even almost with this this strange notion, they took God from us. Praise God, that can't happen, can it? What a a horrible notion. But but this uh, this had become the, the superstitious condition of the people. And into this, we see this representative child. And what it's when this child is born, this daughter in law then immediately upon hearing of this, pains overtake her. She squats down and gives birth and dies in the process. I mean, the unfolding events between these two sons and then their father and then one of the wives is is brutal. But that's only a part of it. There were also 30,000 who were slain that day. This is is a, a, a vicious and bloody situation that we shouldn't take lightly. Sometimes we don't understand disobedience to God, not walking with God, it brings condemnation. The wages of sin is death. And we take that too lightly, and we always like to envision that as something that happens on a bed somewhere, quiet and peaceful, and just kind of off to sleep. That wasn't happening this day. It was much more brutal. And, and this kid was born, and we, it tells us, as this kid was born, verse 21, and she named the child Ichabod, saying that the glory has departed. Now, the term Ichabod simply means this. No glory would be the literal translation. No glory, kabod being the word for glory, and, and so it's a negation. No glory. The glory's gone. Now, some, uh, some think that the phrasing is, is even done. And here's the challenge. A lot of times, whether something is a statement or whether something's a question is based on the inflection. Right? Nice day. Nice day? Well, one cent, one, I'm asking you if you think it's a nice day. Maybe I'm on the other side of the world talking to you on the phone. Nice day? Well, a little bit warm out. Right. Right. But nice day. Oh, that's a statement. Well, hard to get inflection from reading. 
right? And so that's why some will say uh, this is stated as a question that Ichabod means, where is the glory? And uh, I don't know. You know, the arguments on um, whether it means where is the glory on, or, or whether it means no glory, either one of them has this clear result, glory not here. You ask the question, where is it? Why? Right? I, I, where are my glasses? Right, you don't ask that question when I know where they're at. I would ask it when? I don't know. No glory or where is the glory? And it says in here repeatedly because the glory has been exiled or the glory has been departed or the glory has been carried away is the notion that is here. And uh, so this representative kid, Ichabod, represents the glory of God that he had chosen to manifest and set among his people, a people that he had marked out from all the other nations, that he would manifest his glory to them and make known among the nations his glory through them, at times through judging them in condemnation, at times through great deliverances of them. Uh, This God and his glory has now, here it says, Departed, gone, separated. But this representative kid that that speaks of the glory of God somehow being taken away or carried away, it's hard not to see uh, and, and think of the scriptures where it takes us to another child that is born that is the exact opposite of Ichabod. Where the Ichabod is, the glory is gone, no glory. We have another kid who's born as the New Testament comes to us, bringing a new covenant and hope, who is the very presence of God with us. And what do we have in Jesus Christ? The scripture says, concerning him in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what? We beheld his, we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The birth of one Son represented the departure, the absence of glory. Really, the real condition for all sinful men who are in that same corrupted condition of Israel. Apart from God's grace, their lives follow the counsel of their own hearts and their own stubborn wills. Only by grace through faith are our wills brought into submission and love to God and we are changed. We are made new and we are able to see where where there was no glory. And even it tells us in Corinthians that the enemy blinds the eyes of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the glory of God in the face of Christ. In Christ Christ. With this occasion, the glory's gone. In Christ, the glory has come. And that surety is remarkable because in him we also know this. His glory and his glorifying purposes await us. Why? By grace alone. Through faith alone. Because of who Christ was. Listen to what it says in John 2, 11. As Jesus did his work, it says, He did these signs, even the work, first work at Cana, is the first signs where he manifest his glory to them, showing them, I am not like any other. John chapter 11, verse 40. Jesus is talking to Martha, who was despairing that her brother had died. Remember, and Jesus had said, look, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. And and Martha's confused by all of this and says, I don't understand. Jesus says, move the stone away from the grave. Martha's like, ye, four days, stinky. No. And, And what does Jesus say? Did I not tell you that if you believed, the glory of God would be revealed to you? The glory, I mean, so the glory has come. Even indeed, it, we would see in Hebrews chapter one, verse three, what does it say concerning Christ? He is the radiance of the glory of God. 
the exact imprint of his nature. I've heard people say, oh, I wonder where the ark is. If only we could find the ark. Somebody might have even made movies about searching for and finding the ark. Uh, thinking that whoever possesses the ark would be able to rule the world. The ark again, a piece of furniture that represented the presence of God. Christ, the very person and presence of God. God, very God, the Son. If we were to have the ark today, it would be no more useful than this table here. Because those shadows those were passing away. The fullness of glory has come in his son. Don't look to the ark. Don't look to men. Don't look to the church. Look to Christ. He alone is the glory. Listen to him and walk in his ways. Live for him because that's why we have been called and sanctified. So, in closing... Just want to remind you of these seven things that we've seen. They encountered this loss in battle and they faced it with a reasonable question. Why has the Lord defeated us? Understanding God is in control of all things. But they faced that reasonable question secondarily with a wrong course. We got the fix. Not what would God have us do, but we know what we want God to do and we'll make him do it. Well, that wrong course was fraught with remarkable complexity in God bringing out the priests, God bringing them to uh, an unexpected, excessive, and incorrect boldness and confidence, the, the fear of the uh, Philistines, and then their emboldening to fight. We see all those remarkable complexities, and then we see, the fourthly, the resulting capture. The ark is captured. Fifthly, we see a righteous condemnation that God brings his judgment against sin and sinners. Sixthly, we see the ruinous collapse as Eli hears about it and falls and he dies in a recognition that the ark has been taken. And then seventh, we saw a representative kid. But we don't look at Ichabod and we don't fear Ichabod. Do you know why? We look to Christ and in him, the glory will never abate. The glory will never weaken. And when he comes, we will see him in his glory, coming with his mighty hosts. And we will meet him in the air, and we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we just want to uh, give you the glory and the praise. Again, we see in this passage and in your word such need for really not trusting ourselves, not even trusting seemingly wise or seemingly religious men, not trusting tradition and rites and rituals and steps, but Lord, humbly and simply really listening to your word, looking to your will, inclining our hearts to you, giving ourselves in service to you in any way that you might be pleased, understanding that you are the king of glory, that you have called us for your own glory. Use us, God, to bring you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.